Okay, good afternoon. We will be conducting today's meeting in a virtual setting using Zoom to allow council, staff, and public to social distance. Members of the public may view and listen to the meeting today on Zoom or online through the city's YouTube channel. If you would like to participate in live public comment via the Zoom platform, please refer to the agenda for instructions and Mayor Andriotta will begin the meeting momentarily. And Mayor, I do see that Evan is on the meeting great, now. Great, thanks. All right, I'm gonna wait uh, till it's four o'clock straight up and then I'll start. If I go on mute, it's because of the leaf blower right outside the window here. Yeah, that's okay. I think we do that anyway with the pledge on Zoom. It gets kind of echoey. Okay, it's four o'clock. So um, welcome everybody to the February 14th, 2022 City Council Workshop Session Meeting and happy Valentine's Day. Um, I call this meeting to order at four o'clock p.m. Uh, Ms. Gallen, may I have roll call, please? Yes, Mayor. Council Member Joyner? Here. Council Member Carlskin? Present. Council Member Lauritsen? Here. Council Member Silhai? Here, Here but in transit. So my um, camera will be off for like a half hour. Thank you. And Mayor Andriata? I'm here. Thank you. Okay, I have asked um, uh, Captain Evan Faddis if he will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and he has uh, so agreed. So, um, Captain Faddis, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, my pleasure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic in which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. All right. Item number three, public comment. Um, Ms. Gallen, do we have any public comment um, that is not on our agenda today? Uh, so I do have a couple of folks attending, but it doesn't look like they have their hands raised, Mayor. Okay. So no public. Um, okay. Great. Awesome. Okay. So let's go to um, our first item 4A. And this is a revisit council discussion regarding AB 361 to continue with public meetings in a virtual setting due to the spread and risk re relative to Omicron variant of COVID-19 to allow for continued video conferencing of public meetings. Ms. Molenkoff, can you give us a brief update, please? You bet, Mayor. So it will be a very brief update because there is not a lot of significant information since we met together on February 8th to talk about this. The county updated its COVID dashboard the day after on February 9th. It does continue to show um, declining trends as far as new cases. Um, and then we did receive some biobot information from our wastewater treatment plant, which similarly is showing a decline such that we anticipate within the next week or so probably being back to transmission rates that were akin to what we saw last summer. So that's pretty much all that we have. The um, And as you know, the governor's indoor mask mandate is going to be allowed to expire tomorrow. Yeah, that's great news. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so let's just uh, go around and see if the council has any comments or concerns about going back um, to public meetings um, on February 22nd and all of our commissions and, um, and committees. Uh, so I don't know if Alyssa can talk right now, but we'll start with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Joyner. Do you have any comments or concerns? Uh, no concerns at this point. I think I'm inclined to simply let uh, let things expire and go back to in-person meetings. Okay, thank you. Mayor, um, I was gonna say, I agree with Paul with the one caveat that we talked about last week, uh, allowing whatever uh, commissions are already noticed to proceed as noticed this week. And then um, I'll future forward in person. Yes, okay. Yeah. yeah, I got that, thank you. Council member Carlos Kent. I agree with one of my colleagues. Okay, thank you. Council member Lordson. I agree with my colleagues also. 
good. All right. That's an easy conversation because I agree too. And I, and Alyssa's right. We did talk about allowing, um, because I think uh, planning commission is tomorrow, no, Wednesday, right? Um, and whatever. Right, the independent redistricting is tomorrow. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so redistricting tomorrow, planning commission is Wednesday and um, whatever has scheduled right now, but uh, we'll come back in person for council meeting and then everything after that on February 22nd. Is that correct? Correct. The direction we have is that the That's resolution that extended AB 361 findings, you're now withdrawing uh, that state of emergency attendant to that, those findings. Yes. Okay. So I guess my one quest follow-up question will be, will the council chamber be ready? Will those issues be resolved? Good the question. technology issues should be resolved. Well, the TV is in the office. It just has to be installed. Yeah, Gwen, maybe you can share, because actually just the other night, uh, Gwen and, and Jennifer were testing the new system, so. Awesome. Yes, the audio issues have been resolved. Um, we are still working to get trained um, in house, but uh, the next meeting should be perfect. Oh, fine wood, really quick, start knocking yes. on it. <laughs> Gwen, I really appreciate you and Jen and all, all everybody that has worked so hard on this. I mean, we fully understand that, you know, Echo and all that stuff, none of that was you know, that was all stuff that out of everybody's con control, but you guys have worked really, really hard to get it to normal so that the public can participate well, that we can hear, we can participate well. And I really, really appreciate your persistence and uh, getting that taken care of for us. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It, so It's easy when the new city manager says, I don't care what it costs, get it done. Right. <laughs> Love it. All right. So Anything else on this? Oh, public comment. Sorry. Uh, do we have any public comment on uh, AB 361 and going back into person on February 22nd and allowing whatever's scheduled right now to stay virtual until then? Any public comment? Uh, Mayor, I don't have any hands raised. Okay. And, and Mayor, right. just, to, just for clarification on the record, I understand we're going to continue with the hybrid format so that the public can continue yes. to join in to participate remotely, but that we will also be allowing. Uh, members of the public to attend in person. Hundred percent. Yeah, okay. that's the whole conversation about the Zoom and the the echo. Yeah. So you are. Just making, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just no. No. Thank. No. 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 That. Yeah. Thank you. No. That was. I appreciate that clarification because I didn't say that, but you're. You are correct. Yes. I wrote the that. hybrid formula does not allow council no, to attend. It's not, no, it's not council. It's just public. public right? Just the public. Yes. And again, very much appreciated because I know um, there's a lot of residents who, you know, who used to come in person that really can't anymore and they really uh, enjoy the Zoom and it keeps them um, able to participate. So, all right. So staff has direction and we're good on that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys. All right, item 4B. Uh, council discussion of priorities, strategies, and desired outcomes for the use of the American Rescue Plan Act revenue received by the city of Lincoln. So I'm going to let our city manager, Sean Scully, give us a brief update, and then we can talk about it. Thank you very much, Mayor, and good evening, uh, Council. Um, so uh, I'm going to just real briefly give a little bit of ARPA background, just in case there's people from the public that aren't really familiar with it. And then I'm going to get out of the way and let you all battle it out about how, how this money should be spent. Um, but uh, just in case you don't know, um, the funding package, the American Rescue Plan was uh, rolled out roughly $1.9 trillion. About uh, 65 billion of that was allocated to every single city, town, or village across the country. Um, Lincoln's uh, uh, has been allocated approximately 11.5 million. And uh, in, in a funny way, um, I know that since ARPA has come in, there's been a lot of ideas and how should it be used, but not making a decision on that has inadvertently been a very good strategy um, move for the council because the first few rounds of uh, what they call interim final rules, which is basically the treasury department's um, uh, rules about how you can spend this funding and how it should be accounted for um, have become less restrictive in a very important way. Um, you may recall the back during the last bailout package, 
uh, that was passed earlier on in COVID, that money was directly allocated to the city and, base, and it was very broad what you could do with it. Um, this round was uh, quite a bit more restricted, though still quite a few options. But what happened um, just very recently was the Department of Treasury finally issued their final rule. So clarified and refined a set of uh, criteria and, and this is it for now, at least. Um, and the most important component of that was there was a bunch of discussion from cities across the country about how you backfill lost revenue, because the concept is, what would you have received had COVID not wreaked havoc on the country? Uh, and they had sort of a complicated um, uh, calculator uh, on their website and a set of, of methodology, basically, about how a finance professional could calculate what a city lost. And I'm using, you know, air quotes. Um, and that's really difficult to do. And it's really difficult when in the, you know, uh, last six to 10 months, we've had a really aggressive and strong economy, which has been represented in our, our revenue figures. So, of course, uh, it was really great news to find out that the uh, Treasury has basically said that a city uh, may choose to simply claim $10 million of loss with no documentation. It's uh, a blanket $10 million. You can essentially absorb that into your general fund or into a sub account of your general fund. And in a sense, defederalize those dollars, uh, which allows you to um, spend it, you know, some communities will use it truly as reserve to help um, backfill revenues. Other cities will, uh, you know, put it into a variety of different programs is really, uh, it really opens up the full gamut of what you can do. Basically, what I understand from experts I've talked to about this is you can, uh, you can use it on anything you would use your general fund for. So, um, so with that said, of our 11.5, if the council were to choose to do that, that would basically put $10 million uh, into your, uh, we create a separate account and we'll uh, track it. Um, one other little component that um, council member uh, Carlos Kent mentioned to me um, last week, which I did hunt down today and I'm still confirming, I believe that, that if you if the $10 million is the assumed loss the city council agrees to, uh, that eliminates the timeline for spending. So you, you, because if you think about it, what you're really saying is this is lost revenues and we're simply just riding our ship. Um, so you really could be strategic about how you want to use it. And I'll absolutely verify that if I'm wrong about that, uh, it, it means that we have a couple of years where we're going to need to to uh, get this money allocated and spent. So, okay, um, all that to say that you could. I just threw in some ideas just to start the conversation, but you could. Uh, there have been discussion about business grants and nonprofit support. There's been um, talks about this concept of like essentially creating our own grant program to hire firefighters uh, and public safety staff. Uh, you can make capital infrastructure investments. You can support other governmental activities. There are, uh, this is something we'd have to deal with in the labor um, discussions, but certainly there, there are allowances to, to do one-time essential worker bonuses, which a lot of communities are doing uh, for, for the folks that work during the pandemic. And, um, and then certainly any other creative idea that council would like to direct. The only request uh, that I have is, um, even if you don't need to divvy up the 10 million tonight, but if you have two or three ideas and general numbers of what you'd like to allocate it towards, that gives me more than enough direction to really get those rolling. And we're going to have to continue to refine this plan over and over again, because, uh, you know, this is a really rare opportunity to do some, do a lot of good. And, um, so anyway, that's all I have to say. And, uh, also one last thing. The 1.5 million that remains in ARPA, uh, we'll have separate recommendations for you about how to spend that since that is constrained by those rules. But I think the simplest answer to that is some sort of small scale 
capital project in water or sewer because uh, the the bill specifically states that it can go towards those uses. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's the uh, the presentation, and, and then I'm going to be feverishly typing notes as you talk so that I can make sure I get all the direction we need. Okay, thank you, Sean. I really appreciate that. So you kind of answered the one question I had to start off with that the 1.5 restricted. I was going to ask you where kind of where that has to be set aside, but you answered that. So we're probably looking at some kind of uh, uh, I, I thought I was thinking that some some kind of sewer project or water project or it's something along those lines that we have to use it for. Yeah, I think our recommendation would be that we try to pick an area of town um that maybe has old real old lines yeah uh that we really have a tough time funding otherwise and mm -hmm. so that's an opportunity uh, uh to do that okay and just for my information just to uh, interject though go ahead can you i'm sorry go it ahead, doesn't Alyssa. have to be can you hear me it doesn't have to be just on capital infrastructure though that bill sets out a bunch of different areas that we could use it. So capital infrastructure would be one of the most, you know, safest, easiest, but there also, you could do things that have to do with public safety directly related to COVID. You can do homelessness um, triaging. You can do, um, trying to think off the top of my head. There's a, a whole list of items that also, oh, mental health services yep. that um, have a nexus to COVID. There's a whole lot of flexibility. You can do small business grants that have a direct nexus to COVID losses. So there's a whole bunch of wiggle room. And um, that is like an additional like million, right? Like one, one and a half. 1.5 million. Yeah. yeah. So there's, that's actually a, a decent amount where we could put it towards infrastructure or we could put the other part towards infrastructure and we have wiggle room to put it towards other um, essential projects. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I don't know if there's a nexus to COVID, but if we can use it for um, infrastructure or capital improvement, can it be used for roads? I'm not saying I want to, I'm just asking. No, okay. Uh, no. Uh, okay. It's, no, it was specific to water wastewater. Water wastewater, okay, that's, yeah. I just wanted yeah. to clarify it's, on it's, that. It's because it was, it was before the infrastructure package talks came out, and so they were wanting to find a way to help cities be able to handle those issues with COVID funds. That's the only reason why I said that that way. Right. Okay. Thank you. I, I, that's what I was thinking. I wanted to make sure because I'm sure that we might get questions about that. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's explore that a little farther if we can. What if the water and sewer lines go right down the middle of the street? Well, you yeah. Have to break the street to get to the water and sewer lines. Well, but we could potentially use that 1.5 million for the water or wastewater, and we could use the unrestricted 10 million to heal the street because we do have the flexibility on those extra 10 million. It, they didn't care about the street being busted open. No yeah, I mean, if you're saw cutting the street, part of the water project is replacing it. So you could, I mean, that's okay. What what I think is not okay is if like you were resurfacing, you know, whole whole blocks. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Okay, all right. All right, so um, Mayor Pro Tem Joyner, we'll start with you. Go ahead. Uh, actually, I need oh. <laughs> the doorbell just rang and there's nobody oh, here. I okay. need to go check that. I'll get back. Okay, we'll start with Council Member Carlos Skint. Go ahead, Dan. Well, first, uh, I think <clears throat> it's extremely important that we have the answer, <clears throat> the final answer to the question about. <clears throat> is it you commit the money to a fund and because I don't know if people realize the subtlety is all of a sudden you have moved that money from one time money to sustainable money because you could go out five years, 10 years and have the spending plan to spend that money and in fact, one of the things that we've talked about with the grant, the backfill and getting fire up to speed faster using the tax and that was it's a hell of a lot different with a two year timeline on it than it is with an eight year timeline, which is what we have mm -hmm. in the whole project. So I, I, uh, what other 
there are some questions that, um, oh, how the plan, first of all, is this like the ARPA, where you had to have a plan for expenditures? And so my questions are, do we still have to have a plan? How tightly are you held to the plan? And how do you have to report the plan? Okay, so for the, um, the answer to your questions are yes, yes, and uh, don't know, the last part. <laughs> but, um, but here's, so two things. First off, um, the, the confines under which we're operating really mostly apply to the 1.5 million. Once the, the I, and I'm, st I still, you know, be honest with you, I do not have clarity um, and I've searched everywhere and asked lots of questions about whether or not a formal process is needed for council to determine, okay, we're claiming the 10 million. Um, I think we will probably just do that in a vote to be really clear, just so it's part of the record. I don't think uh, we have any problem with that. But. Yeah, uh, but to your point is that uh, the $1.5 million component, yes, we'll need to have a plan. It needs to be well-documented. We're going to have to, yeah, yeah. So if, it's, so if it's okay with everybody, I mean, and, we, and it's fine if you don't want to, but while we, while Sean works on getting more information about the 1.5, you know, the timing and all of that, can we set that aside for right now? We just know that yeah. we have $10 million to work with and then we'll get those details. Yeah. And then, so, so really kind of what we want to focus on right now is um, how much do we want to set aside for business and nonprofit grants? And then we can talk about funding the fire. And then if we have time to talk about any other ideas or you want to throw them out there, let's do that. Um, but let's tackle those two things first, if that's okay with everybody. If it's not, that's fine. You can yell out your ideas or whatever. But we got the 1.5 set aside. Sean's going to give us details on that. Let's talk about business and nonprofit and, and fire. And then if you have other my ideas. Own, just... My only comment on that is if we could overlay it, because we have had some really robust conversations about council's desire for how these funds could be spent. Um, and the last time we had a workshop, we all agreed, or at least like, provisionally agreed that it should be like 80% infrastructure and then the remainder towards other projects. And so I'm told, I personally am totally comfortable with focusing on business, nonprofit and the safer grant idea, but I'd like it to be under that overlay of like, what percentage are we talking about? Have we changed our minds as a council that it's no longer that heavy of an emphasis on infrastructure or are we talking that 20% remainder um, and how we're going to spend that? Well, I, I, I would, oh, go ahead, Dan. Sorry, go ahead, well, Dan. I, I'm sorry. I was kind of assuming that we had decided that 20% was the set aside for business and nonprofits. So That's, that was my understanding, also. So the so two million out of the 10 goes to that priority, which which is in line with our general priorities, which are public safety and the operation of the city is the, the, you know, keeping things running is the most important thing and everything else is secondary. So um, I, uh, um, I just, I, I guess I'd have to re rethink if we're going to redo that, forget it, whether it's 10 million or 8 million or whatever, mm -hmm. we said that 20% of the expendable funds that we have is, uh, would go to the nonprofits and to uh, businesses. Businesses are a much higher priority than nonprofits. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rest of it is to be spent in the best way at the city. We talked to infrastructure because at the time that was the only thing you could spend the damn money on. Mm -hmm. Now that we're no longer tied to infra infrastructure on the eight on the eighty percent, that we have much more flexibility, which is great. Uh, but I still don't think it it 
anything has changed uh, the 80 20 split. My opinion. Well, the only thing that's changed. And, and it could it could adjust that percentage a little bit. The only thing that's changed is that now we know we didn't get the safer grant. And so we were waiting for that before and we couldn't spend it before, but now we can on public safety. So I'm not yeah. saying it does change the percentage, but I'm saying that has that we have that knowledge now where we didn't have it before. We've got a better, you're saying we have a better target yes. to spend our 80% on than we had originally. <laughs> well, yeah. Because my, we couldn't my spend understanding it. though would be that that if we would move forward with that safer grant, that that would, I was looking at it as that would come out of that 80% set aside for like essential city services. Yes. And that that wouldn't touch the 20% for community right. services. Right. That's yeah. exactly right. I and mean, that's my okay. understanding. Okay, that's right? what I was wanting clarity on. So we're still talking 80-20 split, but the safer portion of it isn't out of the 20. Uh, I think that's correct, yes. I mean, unless somebody has an argument against it. Paul, you have a look on your face. Did you want to say something? Uh, well, part of that look might have been that I'm trying to, didn't quite hear Melissa fully. Uh, no, it's, I, I think that what happens for me is I start to drill down when we throw out 20% yeah. uh, for business and nonprofits. What is the actual need there? Mm -hmm. and, and what happens if we wind up down the road? Um, I, obviously, if there's money available, these groups are going to rush in to try to get as much of it as they can. But what, but what is the actual need? Um, and, and what do we do in the eventuality that it is not fully expended uh, over time? I, do, do we want to just start handing this out? Yeah, no, I push it out into the public, I guess. Well, so what I'm concerned about. Yeah, so we can we can definitely have that conversation. I I mean, Alyssa's jogged my memory about the 80-20, but right. it may be that our business community doesn't need $2 million, right? They might. They no, may. but they'd use it. But that that's is the thing. Well, they'd that, absolutely use it. But that's your point, and I'm agreeing with your point, is that just because they would use it doesn't necessarily mean that, that they need that much. They might, but they might not. So right. that's something we have okay. to talk through. Go ahead, Dan. Well, but also, um, Paul, oh, sorry, Dan, go ahead. No, go ahead. What I was going to say is we have much more flexibility in how we structure that now. Now that that $10 million can be absorbed as general fund backfill, my understanding is that there isn't a timeline on when those funds have to be expended because we are basically paying ourselves. And what we do with that is what we do with that. They're now general fund money. So we could set aside the $2 million, and it doesn't have to be just for business. In my mind, which I've said the whole time, I would really, really, really like to see us do something in the mental health space for our families and our residents. People, students in particular, have been hit very, very hard by all of the COVID protocols over the last two years. Um, and I would love to be able to do something that funds a grant program or support for that. And that would be the out of the business nonprofit section. Um, we don't have to say, here's $2 million, let's so spend it in the first year. We could say, here's 20% we've set aside. Mm -hmm. We're willing right. to create a grant program of XYZ under this time frame, and then we'll come back and maybe there will be a second tranche coming out based on community need, and we can we can structure it as we go. We have much more flexibility than we did before. Right, and, and I understand that and don't disagree with it, but um, I... I I don't forget that the county has a big chunk of money too, mm -hmm. and they have health and human services and the lighthouse is their organization for the most part. So, so what would that look like if the city were to try to set something up like this? And go ahead, Dan, you look, yeah, I see your hand up. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Alyssa said some of it. You set the $2 million aside, you, set up you, you don't hand the money out willy-nilly mm -hmm. you decide what we want to do with it, how we want to support a business you put constraints on the grants if that's what we do and then if the people have a need to fill they apply for the grant and they get it mm -hmm. if uh, uh and the, the split between businesses and uh, 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 
nonprofits. Nonprofits. Uh, you know, that's another split that we make mm -hmm. as uh, prioritizations. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, there is money for the business community also from the county and from the state. In each case, we are supplementing something that is best in particular for the city of Lincoln. If you set aside that $2 million to help businesses and you put a grant program out and you get two companies that accept the, the that need that have the need and accept the grant and fills out fill out the paperwork, the excess money can still be held, help still be used to support the businesses by some sort of other program, mm -hmm. whether it be funding the down, rewrite of the downtown plan, doing a zoning plan, all of the things that we have said over the past years could help the business community. Uh, what we are deciding tonight, I think for Sean is, we have a windfall, pardon me, we have hard earned yeah. revenue replacement money. Tax money. Uh, that how do we, what's the importance of spending it from a council desire standpoint? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I kind of okay with, we say we, we have the $2 million pot, 20% that we're setting aside to support businesses and nonprofits. I don't think we have to define, a, you know, it gets back then to how, to, how does it have to be spent and how fast does it does. But based on our conversation today, that's the decision that we make today. Mm -hmm. We have the 80%, that there's a whole bunch of, of creative ways that I can think of spending that, because it's just general fund money. Mm -hmm. so, 80%. so I think when, in a minute, when, when we get through rounds of talking and we let the public talk, I think... Tom and Drury can shed some light because he already has um, kind of a program uh, application for businesses that that we can just because it he already has it and it's worked well in the past. And if we agree with it, then we can go ahead and use that. And, and Tom is going to help us uh, facilitate that if the council agrees with that. Um, and so I think it might take us a little bit more time to identify nonprofits and mental health and all of that. But I think we probably don't want to wait too long on deciding how much we want to allocate for businesses and then get going with the application because they, they really need it. They're, they're hurting. And I agree with Alyssa, the mental health um, part is important too, but Tom already has the application and all of that um, ready, ready to go. And we can let him speak on that in, in just a little bit. Um, so, so here's right. where I think I'm still stuck. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. We have not done a needs analysis. R right. We're, we're, we're just generally saying, I would feel good about this percentage going to that. Right. But well, we're okay. not really taking a hard look at the needs would it be, uh, and trying to address those. Would it be appropriate right now to have Tom get on and, and kind of share that so we kind of have an idea? And well, what I don't know that he's done a needs assessment either. He's got a program put together, correct? Well, but he's got a pulse of the businesses. So you're right. And it's we can not do that. The same but thing. What was that, Alyssa? I, to Paul's point, it's not the same thing. I do think that I don't have a problem with saying 80 20, here's our initial idea split, and then putting a needs assessment out to see if that 20% is overblown or not, um, just to give us a ballpark and staff a ballpark on what we're working for. But I would agree with Paul that if we're going to expend one time monies that we will never have again, um, we probably want to make sure that we're putting it to where the most need is and we would need to do some sort of like community pulse needs assessment outreach for that. The you know, one other point um, that I wanted to make also is you said, let's put aside that 1.5 million and only talk about the 10, except for that I don't think we want to actually do that because the business program 
would be in line with that 1.5 million. I don't know that we want to do the safer program under that 1.5 million, even though it's in line with it, unless the timelines have changed because we want the longer timeline for the program that we're doing. Um, but that 10 million that we get to absorb, that's where the flexibility comes in. That's where we could say, hey, we want to fix this pipeline or we want to fund a general plan revision or we want to fund a downtown master plan. That, that is the only place that those dollars can be that flexible and are not held under the ARPA rules. And so we want to save as much of that money as possible. So to the extent that we can use the 1.5 towards programs like this, which are 100% under the program or should be, um, it would save us significant dollars to put towards projects that we are constantly telling people, well, we don't have the money to do that for. So that would be my only other um, thought that popped into my head. Uh, Mayor, <clears throat> um, just one point to Council Member Solheis' point. Um, it, it should just be really clear that um, if we fund, even in part, the small business or business grant program out of the 1.5 restricted funds, that that would create a situation where the grant will need to be very, very narrow and targeted and like literally related to like things like PPE and, you know, COVID related stuff and not, not nearly as flexible, uh, which I think was the point that a that, uh, few of you had made, but I just want to be clear about that. Part. Yeah, thank that's you. correct. It would have to be tied to COVID loss, um, but yeah. maybe we do. Maybe we do two two different ones. I'm going to log off and log back on. I'm finally home, so give me a few minutes and you'll see me again. Okay, thanks. Good. Let's decide. <laughs> <laughs> let's throw it to Bill. Yeah, I was just going to say, Bill. What, what do you What do you like to say, Bill? Well, we, you know, uh, from what I hear, we have two different funds. We have the ten million dollars, which is unrestricted. And the 1.5, which is restricted, we have to use that for something related to COVID. Now, the 10 million, if it's unrestricted, we don't have to spend it within two years. We could possibly use that for things like, uh, you know, public safety or something like that. Um, uh, you know, as, as, as a, a bridge until we get to a point where we can get more money uh, from uh, uh, tax revenue. And probably we, should, we really, and I really feel we, we really need to be a bit more um, aggressive with the county and getting our fair share. So yeah, we could use that money. The 1.5, yeah, that's going to be, that, that is restricted. And uh, mental health and uh, it could be one thing that you could, you could certainly tie that to uh, COVID and um, homeless, you can tie that to home, uh, probably COVID. So, you know, it, it just depends. And, you know, tw carving out 20% of the 10 million, you know, if, if, if there's a need for it. Yeah. I um, I was thinking that the share to nonprofits was a much smaller share of dollars of the two million. That's what my so thought it's, was. It's like ninety ten. Yes, in my mind. Yes, and I the would rest agree with is, that, Dan. Yeah, the rest is business oriented, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily mean grants to business it's it's the and and that and the needs and that's where you need to do the needs assessment you know um, but we we need also need to hear from tom yeah i you know the in my mind theoretically we could take a million dollars one of the one of the problems with one-time monies uh, historically is you uh, buy some capital equipment. You don't hire people because that you don't do that, but you buy a piece of capital equipment. And then two years later, you find out you don't have the budget to maintain it. Okay. I mean, that's a very typical... We built fire stations. We bought fire trucks. They sat there empty because we didn't have the people to man them. Okay. Um, it's the same with a lot of the, you know, buy radios and all of a sudden you, you can't afford to maintain them. My, one of the things running in my mind is 
that you could buy capital, whatever, and fund an endowment with this thing money. I mean, with money, so that you don't have you take the you take that maintenance and operations thing out of the picture. That's a far stretch, you know, but it's just an expansion of of using the money over eight years to do something else or five years. So um, I, I think that there's potentially a lot of opportunity to be very creative to really get more leverage out of that $10 million than just spending $10 million. So okay. I'm just filling time until Alyssa got her. <laughs> Thanks. She's here. So if, if nobody if if nobody objects, um, so we can you know uh, move the conversation along about the business. Can can uh, we have Tom kind of share what his thoughts are and and uh, where he kind of what he thinks the needs are maybe, and then we can kind of decide where we want to go for that and then move on to the the fire discussion. Tom, are you available? Yeah, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank yes. you. Okay. I'm in the kitchen in the chamber. My internet's not working very well, so I'm on my phone. Um, no, I appreciate the conversation. You know, we've been, Mark Scott and I have been doing this for about five months and going back and forth. We did do a survey um, about three to four months ago. And I, I can, because of the Brown Act, I didn't want to send it all to you guys, but um, I can send that to Sean like I sent to Mark and um, the survey, I believe, and I wish I had it right in front of me. I have every, I got 300 pages here, but I forgot the survey, but the survey pretty much went out to DLA and uh, chamber members. And I think we had about 60 respond, I think 60, 70 responses. Majority of the responses, this is what Mark Scott was looking for was uh, the number one issue right now was uh, Revenue, loss of revenue, they exhausted their savings. They're trying to, um, besides having staffing issues, but trying to, uh, you know, so afford their employees, uh, employee retention. Um, some were talking about doing capital improvements. Um, you know, I know several restaurants in town that want to add a patio. And, you know, is there any kind of matching grant program, matching funds they can do possibly with that? That was one idea. Um, but, but the survey really just showed that most of the people were still hurting financially. And a couple, well, last month, I think I called Holly and, and Mark and said, you know, we just had the Nostry closed down for two weeks. We just had Monk Cellar. We had PJs over here shut down. You know, they're still hurting, you know, and we're kind of numb to the fact that, you know, two years ago, we, we didn't know what to do. We wanted to help everybody. And the county stepped up with that 16 million and really did help some, but uh, now when we see a business closed due to COVID or uh, in staffing issues, we just kind of, you know, uh, we feel bad, but we're not taking action. And that's what I really paid attention to the last month or so. And it's really, uh, this makes me nervous because there are the, some of the businesses are really struggling. They, they exhausted all their, all their capital and they're just hanging on. And now with the staffing issues, it's just exacerbating everything. But um, but I can get you a copy of that survey and we could re rephrase those questions and do a needs assessment like Paul's talking about. Um, again, we, we kind of did that, but we can I can get it to a few of you and then you guys can figure out how to um, at least look at the one we did. Uh, that's number one. Um, again, being very creative, I've been working with Elk Grove, Rachel Brown, she's the economic development manager. And Elk Grove, the city council approved a $4 million business and nonprofit grant program. Of that $4 million, they were only able to hand out, uh, grant out 1.2 million because of the application process and the criteria was so stringent that they, they were only able to give out 1.2 million. 
So Rachel brought it back to city council last or two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. I have it right in front of me here um, where the council redlined a lot of their stuff. And now they streamlined it into a one page application, basically asking about their revenue losses in 2020 um, from 2019, really simplified it. But I agree with you that I think we should be creative and not just get, hand this money out. And doing another needs assessment is a definite. Um, on the nonprofit side of things, I've been working with the Lincoln Community Foundation because they, they kind of have the, the pulse on who really needs stuff, uh, you know, help. Um, but I like the list of idea about working with the, the mental health because uh, there's just so many. <laughs> well, you can talk to Gary McDonald, he'll tell you the stories. But um, uh, like I said, I I'm here just. Whatever I can do to help, I, I know the business community has been kind of waiting for it. I got two or three emails last week saying, hey, you've been talking about this, this grant program. Where is it? Um, and I just said, well, the city, we're, we're still going through all the financial, you know, figuring it all out. So, um, again, if I can answer any questions, um, but the one thing I will say is there is still a big part of the community, business community, that's struggling financially. And, um, you know, Elk Grove, what they did, I, I was really surprised that the criteria was based on like, like home-based businesses. They, they were doing just a flat $500 grant. I thought that was a little low, but that's what they did for the home base. And then they had some targeted businesses uh, based on their revenue. If their revenue was 1000 to 100000 they got a $3,500 grant. If their revenue is from 100 to $1 million, they got 7,000. And if it's from 1 million to 3 million, they got 10,500. And then there's one other grant program they did with a little, little high, um, higher than that. But anyway, it's more of a targeted sector and they're handing out 5,000, 10,000 and $15,000 grants. Um, real fast the, on the last uh, CARES Act funding that we did with the county, you know, the chambers solely did that 1.3 million and Lincoln received one, 75, I believe, 175,000. And we had 83 applications and we, we handed out 75 uh, grants and they averaged about 3,500 bucks. So um, from 1,500 to uh, 3,500. Um, but anyway, the city of Bell Grove really took a good hard look at this. And, um, you know, I'd be, like I said, I'm more than happy to uh, talk about you know um, what they're doing, but that's it's they just opened up the second round today. So with that, if there's any questions, um, again, I do have a the proposal Mark and I were working on. The only piece out of it, I, I we did one application for businesses, one for nonprofits. For example, nonprofits um, we put in there. We didn't put the criteria how much they can apply for because I, I like the idea of being able to apply up to a certain amount, but they have to justify it. And we have a committee that goes through that. Um, but they, we put on there on the application, uh, subject to your guys' you know, approval, is a uh, grant amount cannot exceed, you know, 10% of your gross you know, revenue or whatever, you know, it's, um, but anyway, we have the outline. It worked well with the county program. And I think we can just maybe make several different grant programs and really get a good bang for our buck. But time is of the essence. So with that, Holly, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up for a while. Oh, thanks, Tom. Um, so here's a question for you and then for the council. Tom, is it, it would it be too short of a time for you to, um, and if the council wanted to put in, put on it, to throw out another a survey or needs assessment this week um, so that we kind of have some more data by next um, council meeting on the 22nd, or would you need like another week and for us to tackle that on March 8th? No, I can, I can do that probably tomorrow. I can, I can put it together um, and, and get you guys all the uh, results. Um, the, the business community they, they, and nonprofits actually responded pretty well. So uh, we can do that and um, it, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, so then my next question is to the council. What what would you if he if if uh, Tom helps us do that? What what do you want to see? What kind of questions or what kind of feedback would you you like to do a needs assessment? Just their revenue loss or um, what their needs are at the moment? 
Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, well, I'm scratching my head and thinking here. Uh, my first thought is, is, Tom, do you have the ability to push beyond just the DLA and the chamber members uh, and go to the business community at large? Um, uh, yeah, I was working with, I believe her name is Anna from the city. Um, she, she sent me, a, we did this several times with the county, so we can do, we, we can send it out to all the businesses in Lincoln. Um, not, it's a little more trickier because we're going to, you know, I know we want to include home-based business, so there's a lot. And yeah, so, that gets rougher. That yeah. gets rougher. I understand that. I, I, I guess in my mind, I'm, I'm looking heavily at brick and mortar. Okay. Um, you know, home base is an interesting area that I don't know that I've focused a great deal on. Um, but I'm, I'm open to exploring that. Um, so just off the top of my head, if we're saying that, that these dollars are intended to mitigate the impacts of COVID, um, I, I guess I'd kind of want to know what the impacts of COVID are on the business. Um, exactly. Yeah. You yeah. know, and the financial impacts are. And I I guess I have a cautionary tale in this. Uh, when I first came on the council, a local business uh, that was, I thought, doing very well had an issue um, over an invoice the city had sent. I managed to get that invoice waived that was. Um, about $20,000 if memory serves. And that business shut down within a month. Yeah. So what I'd hate to do is throw a big chunk of money at an at-risk business that isn't gonna help them survive um, and, and just have them close within a short period of time. So I don't know how we, how we touch on that. I'd, I'd almost rather help stabilize them then yes. throw a chunk of money at them only to discover that it really wasn't of any substantial assistance and, uh, in keeping them open. And we did have one local business uh, do that with a $50,000 grant from the county, by the way, and they shut down immediately after that. So believe me, that's on the top, top of my mind. <laughs> yeah. So how do we put a mechanism in here that, that I don't know that you do. If they're shutting down, they're probably filing for bankruptcy and yeah, there's I no mean, recovery I, of that. I think that it's safe to say, Council Member, jo or excuse me, Vice Mayor Joyner, that um, there, there is certainly that possibility. Tom has shared the evaluation criteria that he's put together, and it's pretty good. I think that, you know, my recommendation is going to be that, you know, uh, you set up um, a truly, usually it's best to maybe partner with a couple chamber people and a, and a couple of staff people that have basically your evaluation committee. And um, if they have questions about, you know, the health of a business, um, it's certainly appropriate to be bouncing that application back to the, the applicant and said, hey, you know, can you provide us a little bit more about how you're doing, you know, what's your five-year plan, um, and drill down at least enough to feel fairly comfortable that while that may happen, we can minimize it to the greatest extent. Okay. And I also, I think... <laughs> I think most of us, well, I should say uh, on our side, we know some of the businesses are truly teetering right now and we could be very cautious with that. I, and I had no problem disclosing if we get applications because um, there is a, we can create a matrix and uh, you know, we, 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 we uh, you know, the criteria that we look at, um, it, it, it did work really well. I can't think of one business at, uh, on the other program we did that, that shut down or, or just kind of took the money and ran. Um, I just think of the one that did a different program that was not cool. <laughs> Boy. No, not cool at all. So let me say this. I, I, I love the notion of, and I can make the nexus of uh, helping some of these businesses open up uh, patios, outdoor dining spaces, uh, potentially parklets, that type of thing um, that would allow them to continue to do business in the eventuality we get shut down again. So I'm, yeah. I'm open to that. I'm open to creativity in, in uh, you know, whether it's facade grants or, or whatever else 
might help those businesses along. I'm, I'm absolutely open to those. Uh, I just want to make sure we're getting the biggest bang for our buck. Yeah, I just had I just had a business call me last week that's getting that wants to replace their facade at thirty thousand dollars, and <laughs> and they were like, "Didn't you say there's a grant program coming down the road?" I said, "Yes, it's it's coming, but we're not we're still not there yet." So there are some pretty good examples out there that people, even if it's in a matching grant fund, if we take a part of the money higher dollar part and make it matching they got to put up 50 grand we give them 50 grand if you know i mean that's one way we can go on a certain amount of the, of the funds and get the biggest bang for our buck but um but i think we we can do that needs assessment i can get it i can get it to you within a day or two um and you guys you know holly sean uh, uh, christine can look at it and let me know and then we can push the button and get it out it, Tom, if council is okay with this, it might just be easiest for us to agendize the agreement with the chamber as well as, um, you know, to administer the program as well as the cr evaluation criteria that you've already put together. And then by the time it gets to council, uh, it, you know, I guess that would be the, what, March 3rd or, yeah, March 3rd meeting. Uh, uh -huh. You'll have any info you need on a needs assessment. That way council can just sort of hash it out there, approve hopefully approve, you know, the program, we can open it. Yeah, that sounds good. Hey, uh, <laughs> Alyssa, I, did, I do see your hand. Go ahead. I was just waiting for her time to finish. Go ahead. No problem. Um, I just wanted to, I have maybe an unpopular opinion on that discussion that maybe I shouldn't even be saying while recorded, but I feel like this, you know, money, their taxpayer dollars that we have to spend in our community that were accumulated on the back of these business owners who lost everything because of really dysfunctional government policies. And initially the grants that we would have put out to them would have had to have a direct nexus to revenue loss. I have zero, um, maybe not zero, but very few issues with putting money out to a business as revenue replacement, and then they don't make it. Okay, they're still in our community. There's still families and residents of our community who have suffered greatly. So if the confines that we put around it are so constrained where it is showing a direct revenue loss from COVID and that's how they're being able to receive that revenue loss funding and then they do their best and then they close. Okay, these are taxpayer dollars from them, from being contributors to our economy. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Well, and, and like I it's said, the, it's the, the actual the, intent of the money. No, and like, like I the said, there was the money one. wasn't. Hold okay. on, real quick. The the intent of the money wasn't beautification of storefronts. It's let's help people who have been severely impacted by COVID. I don't have a problem with with beautifying storefronts since we have flexibility if we're going to use that unrestricted fund portion. But if we're not, the money is to help people who suffered. I don't have a problem with it. Well, and, and like I said, there's only one business that I know of that shut their doors after receiving grant funds. So that was out of, you know. The, and my the, guess is it broke their heart more than it upsets us that they did that. Yeah. That's someone's entire, like, you know, Tom, you're a former business owner. You pour your heart and soul into those when you own a business. Mm -hmm. If they had to take the money and they had to shut, that probably oh. hurt them more than it hurt anyone else. Oh, trust me, my the 400 members here, it's like being a bartender every week. You know, I get calls and the stories and the emails and yeah. it's crazy. It's really yeah. crazy. The stories you, you get from these people and it's so sad. It breaks my heart. My wife's like, why are you so depressed? I'm like, trust me. Yeah, That's no exactly idea. it. I don't have any problem. If, if we're going to put together a grant program for businesses, we have enough money. And the entire purpose of it was to help those who struggled from COVID. I think that we should honor that. That's a good point. So let's go out um, to see if there's anybody else in the public who has comment on this. I know Evan has his hand raised, but I think he's wanting to, he's waiting to speak about fire, but we can, we can ask Gwen, is there anybody else who has their hand raised? Yes. Uh, Dre, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Dre. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> Um, my name is Driana Bravo, and I'm the director of the Foundry Youth Center. Um, it's a nonprofit in downtown Lincoln. And I had a question about the needs assessments for nonprofits. If you were only going to go through the Lincoln Community Foundation for the nonprofits they see as having needs, or if there would be a way for us to 
you know, give an email or some way to make sure that um, our needs are assessed as well? That's a really good question. Um, my initial answer would be that we would want to see your personal response. And so I think the Lincoln Community Foundation is just wanting to help facilitate that. It's, uh, it's still up to council's approval. So it's not that the, the Lincoln Community Foundation is making decisions. They're just helping us facilitate that. Um, so we would definitely want to but see- Was that our intent or was our intent to, to go nope. through them and allow them to, to run the program? Well, so yeah. Okay, Sean, maybe you can clarify. I mean, they're going to help us facilitate it, but it, but all of it is still up to our our. our it, I think Holly's point is is that if they were going to run the program for us, we would still, much like the question you asked Tom, if you have access to the broader business community on your need assessment, yeah, Lincoln Community Foundation would need to be reaching out to all nonprofits. So whatever needs Dre has. Lincoln Community Foundation would need to be facilitating that input prior to making any decisions. And I agree with that. But what I heard was yeah, that the council direction. was going to have to approve the final allocations to those not-for-profits. And that was not my understanding. Of yeah, I, and I would very, very, very strongly recommend against that. I think you want, you want, a, you want a, a, a clinical process. So there's no buddy saying, hey, I, I knew a council member and so I got Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, that and can I say something? Can I just say one more thing? Hold so on. Tom, we, Tom real, real quick, hold on. Dre, does that answer your question? Can you still hear me? Yes. Does that answer your question? Um, yes and no, because I know um I've been talking to Lincoln Community Foundation, so I know that I would be take we would be taken into consideration. I just worry about if there's nonprofits like we just barely started making communication with them. So I just would hate for some nonprofits to fall through the cracks. Well, well we, we have a pretty extensive, I mean, we pretty much know all the nonprofits. And that's one reason when I was talking with Mark Scott about this, um, I said, you know, you guys were talking about having the chamber do this. I said, well, I, I feel more comfortable is partnering with, uh, a nonprofit that wasn't going to apply for grant funding and work together with them. And that's, that's what we basically have been doing. That's why we had the applications ready. And uh, so, like I said, we're just, I'm, I'm steering the ship, but we have the Lincoln community foundation is, is more willing to, again, uh, do the assessment with us. You know, I don't, I think we have it pretty well worked out. Um, and I can give you a report or how we're going to do it, whatever you want. But but they're just in the mix um, because, like I said, they know the nonprofits. That's what they do. And um, we're not going to leave anyone out. That's the whole point of getting them involved um, is so we don't leave anyone out, big or small. My only concern that just got raised is I know that you said, you know, we know the nonprofits. I would want to make sure that if we're deferring judgment, which I do believe we should to Sean's point, Mm -hmm. to a third party entity to make those decisions that the decisions are based on like some impartial grid or first come first serve or something where there is I don't want to be accused of favoritism but I'll be damned if somebody else is accused of favoritism because I deferred judgment so that they could take the heat like it needs to be a clinical assessment it needs to be something that all organizations and entities that service our community or within our community are informed of they're surveyed, they're eligible to apply, and they have an equal and fair chance at the funds. Um, so that would be my, mm -hmm. my priorities. Yep. Good point. Okay. So go ahead, Paul. I, I largely agree with that, but that's in direct conflict with your perception of how to do funds for the businesses, which was no, it's not. It's, it's all based on what our criteria is. So if our business criteria says you are eligible under X, Y, Z, and one of them is direct loss of revenue due to COVID-19 protocols, funding, whatever, and they can show and substantiate their funds, which was the criteria for the last year plus. So if businesses have been doing this, then they're eligible under that. If they're wanting to, however we structure it, it just needs to be sterile. Right. So that's my point is that All there right. has to be a sterile criteria. And then whoever is, however it's formatted is how it's formatted so that I'm everyone that. knows there's an even playing field. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Agreed. 
All right, any other public comment, Ms. Gallen? Uh, so Mr. Andrieri has his hand raised again. Okay. Go ahead, Tom. Um, were you needing to speak again? Well, yeah, I was just, I was just gonna say that in the, in the, the grant proposal, we have a matrix in there that, that you have an eligibility, like, you know, like for, instance, for instance, you must, you know, must business applying must be physically located within the city of Lincoln. Businesses must have been business before March 1st, 2020. We have a whole list that you guys can go over and approve or, or disapprove. And then we have a matrix in, in the business portion. We actually had a matrix of, of, this is last year, of course, when the restaurants and hospitality were hit the hardest and salons. So we actually had a matrix. If we had too many applications or not enough funding, we could set aside those applications. And we, again, we funded 75 out of 83. So those eight applications were basically home-based businesses that the county didn't want to um, didn't want to fund because they were they were usually giving us their mortgage payment and they run their business out of the house and they wanted five thousand dollars and and those are the ones we didn't fund, but we were—they were clearly in the bottom of the matrix. They gave us. Because Jennifer, you know, Hanson and I did this along with Pam, and um, it was a pretty clear cut. Looking at the applications, they attested to what they—they—they they, they signed off on, and we just went through them and uh, had a simple matrix to go through. So I think if we can create that to, to your, you know, suffice so your to your approval, then I think it's home free. I mean, there might be a few. We have to do, uh, you know, do some research on it. Like Sean said, there's nothing inappropriate of asking them to give us more data. So that that's kind of the way we did it before, and that's how it's structured now. You just have to look at if you feel it's okay. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. Thank you. So um, if the council has more questions or comments, that's fine. But um, Sean, so. If Tom go, goes ahead and puts out this survey and needs assessment and he gets going on that this week, were you saying a minute ago that we could get it scheduled for the March March um, 1st workshop or can we get it on the agenda for the uh, February 22nd? What what were you saying about that? I don't think, I, I'll have to talk about it with Gwen. I don't think yeah. I have enough time to get it on for the 22nd. That's, but, that's fine, yeah. But I could, cool. you know, we'll get it on for the first available meeting after okay. that and it'll be to you fully baked. And if you decide you wanna make some tweaks and changes, great. But the idea being that we hopefully get your approval and it gets executed immediately and Tom hits the streets because his point is well taken, which is that, you know, we really could go through and debate this for a really long time. Um, but, you know, the, the need is now. The need is now, yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, can I just ask one quick question, Mary, so that I have on, I'm making yes. my notes here. Um, so the 20% fully understand. And then um, I think council member, um, uh, I believe it was Joyner mentioned that the council had previously discussed basically a 90-10 split, 90% of that. That was, that was Dan. Oh, oh that was Dan. Dan. Okay. And that Dan was a Carl Skent compromise. Carl Skent compromise. His understanding was that we would do 90% uh, business and 10% nonprofit. Is that what you're saying, Dan? I, didn't, that, I, I, I expected something like that. Okay, okay. We never got... We never got the case. Because that would be great if you could come to some sort of collective concurrence on that right now. That'd be really helpful. That's $1.8 million for business and $200,000 for nonprofits, just in case you want to know the math. So 80-20, 50-50, what, Alyssa, what, what are you thinking? I think we need to have a more robust discussion because I feel like we could use these funds or some of these funds on homelessness intervention. Paul and I have been on that task force. We're talking, we don't want this big regional super center. Um, so what does that look like for our community and what other mitigation measures are we willing to bring? Well, we can spend this funding on something like that. So let's not just give it all away because we have it. I kind of feel like we, we need to spend it because to Tom's point, our businesses are hurting now. So let's figure out what percentage we're going to put towards our businesses and get that out the door. But we don't need to be like my 10 year old who every time he's got like a hundred bucks from his birthday in his pocket, it's gone the next week. Um, and I, those Legos are cool, but you know, then he finds a cooler set next, the week after that and he's bummed about it. So I just feel like we could use it on a bunch of things. Like we could um, put it towards mental health, which again, I'm going to keep beating that drum, maybe because I'm the mother of three young children and I see all of the kids and 
a lot of a lot of them are really, really struggling. And we have um, a significant amount of youth in our community who don't have access to regular health care. It would be great if we could provide, you know, uh, funding for them to be able to have access to a therapist or whatever, or family services. Um, but there are other uses for those nonprofit dollars. So I would hate to restrict it to such a small, and I don't think it means the lighthouse, no offense to the lighthouse. I think the lighthouse is great, but there are other nonprofits in our community who are also doing things who might have proposals in this space. So I think we want to think very broadly and inclusively, um, in my mind, it's it's not 50-50. I think our businesses deserve more than a 50% split, but I don't think that they should get 90%. So I don't even know that they get 80%. So 75-25? As a I'd be like, I'm like thinking, I don't I, mean, I think it depends what we want to do. Do we do we want to divert any of it? Can we use is it enough to do something useful in those other spaces? I I, well, I think that those discussions we need to to entertain. Well, Paul, you, you look like you're chewing on something you want to say, so spit it out. Um, well, I think we recognize the urgency within the business community, and we want to get that program rolling out fast. Um, Correct. What, what I'm doing is, is I'm watching as we play that, that game again of trying to come up with percentages that aren't attached to a needs assessment. That, um, and, and that makes me uncomfortable. I, I yep. want to be able to address the needs yeah. that exist first and foremost. And then if there's more beyond that that we can do, uh, I'm willing to listen to that. But but when I'm just but, randomly hearing percentages, it's, it feels like a slider to me. No, no, you're, what you're hearing is priorities. Yeah, right. Any in, in, in. But attached to what, Dan? Mm -hmm. Attached to what? Well, I'm, I'm, there is between mental health and homelessness, there is more than a $1.8 million need mm -hmm. in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. That's the whole 20%. And probably, probably there is more than a $1.8 million need for businesses, particularly if we include uh, covid eyes uh, protection for the future, which are things like uh, grant programs, share, uh, uh, sharing grant programs to put in outdoor, okay? I'm saying that we only have $10 million. It was a pretty good decision, pretty easy decision to say our priority is 80% to the city general fund to cover a myriad of shortfalls, 20% to these other two communities. No, we, I didn't hear any dissension or any discussion. I mean, we had some discussion the first time we talked about it. But it stayed 2080. Um, now we're talking about splitting up to 20. And um, a need, if you did, did needs equal. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think what you're saying is. Both of them. You know, you're, we're you're not going to be able to we're not going to be able to give Sean a, a real answer until we do the needs assessment. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of what well, you're yes and for. no. But I think Dan's point was we're also prioritizing the funds, right? We're going to do a needs assessment and we're going to find out that the need is far exceeding two million dollars in mental health and far exceeding two million dollars in homelessness. We this don't know, a, know what it is in business, but we know that we're going to put together to aside a significant chunk because that can also hopefully go future forward and we're not completely out of this yet, right? And there's some other things that we've been wanting to do that this could be spent on like the downtown general plan. That's something I think we should talk about. Um, I think that was your point, right, Dan? That like, yes, we yeah. need a needs assessment, but also right now we can just prioritize with what we want to we're, weigh we're, heavier. We're, we're setting, if you will, setting policy. Yep. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's gonna- and, You know, we could always do something um, 
you know, first call kind of thing where, you know, you have multiple rounds because presumably you're, you're at, at least 50% of that funding, you know, it sounds like will and should go to business. So you can refine that number as we keep talking this through. In the meantime, when we bring you the evaluation criteria, by then we'll have some sense of the need assessment and in meeting, you can determine, okay, let's put, um, you know, $1.2 million towards this or whatever that number. So for me also, Sean, that, that breakdown is very dependent on what this program looks like. Are we doing a business program that covers beautification and everything else? Because if so, that's coming from our unrestricted general fund dollars. Are we doing one that is related to all of the ARPA nexus and which so that's the $1.8 million. Like where are we taking it from? Are we intentionally taking it from our flexible funds and then using the 1.8 to backfill infrastructure because we know we can? Okay, so if they're the flexible funds, what if we just provisionally to start with said, let's create a business program based off of 50% as a first tranche, and we'll do the needs assessment as we go. If we need to do a second tranche, then we can decide what additional percentage of that remaining 50% goes to business. And that's when we can make the decision on the final split between nonprofit and business, since we're not trying to get the nonprofit out of the door right now, because we need a lot more discussion around what that looks like. Obviously don't want to hold off too long, but like we could do a follow-up workshop on that. And then we might have the needs assessment information back and give you a second tranche of funds and have that final determination. Would that work for everyone? I can live with that. Yes, that would be fine. That'd be Why don't we do that? Okay. Love this. Okay, great, Sean. Clear okay. direction. Awesome, thank you. All right, so let's, if that's okay with everybody, thank you, Alyssa, for that. I really appreciate it. Let's let's move on to the discussion about fire. So, Sean, you want to start that off, or should we sure. just what discussion about fire? Uh, what was that? What was what that discussion about fire? Oh, moving to we're going to move on to the safer grant for safer program grant discussion. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, just so everybody kind of understands, because I think council and I have all talked about this individually, but just so the community understands. Um, uh, my predecessor, Mark Scott, had a really great idea, um, which is why he's Mark Scott. And it was that, um, so we didn't get a safer grant, um, but he had an idea that what we perhaps do instead is we use some of this unrestricted, mo unrestricted money and self-fund a safer grant to bring on um, a number of more firefighters into that department to sort of help right-size the the, you know, serious staffing deficiency. And hopefully, as would be the same with a safer grant, by the time that that funding sort of runs out, most of your new tax sharing agreements will have helped hopefully picked up the, the burden of that uh, salary or your general financial outlook is improving. And so you can afford it anyway. Um, but essentially just sort of self-fund a grant. And the one comment, which was really great, um, was, hey, that's concerning though, because we have to use this money in these tax sharing agreements for safety. Um, and so we don't wanna be paying for something that we should be spending this tax revenue on. And so I think that what we had discussed was setting it up sort of as a match and it'll take a little bit of, of you know, uh, truing up probably towards the end of every year, but it gives us the ability to basically use every last dollar we're getting out of that new tax sharing agreement and then fund the remainder of the salary and benefits from, from ARPA for a, a, few, per, a few years. So um, that's the concept. And I have, I'm gonna fully put together sort of a model of how I think it could work for the council to consider, but I just wanna be sure that this is the road we wanna walk down before I put myself out there. Right, thank you. So um, would it be okay with the council before we start discussing if I let Captain Faddis share what he would like to share and then we can discuss it? Is that okay with you guys? Fine. Okay. That works. Okay. Evan, go, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and, um, and share with us your thoughts, please. Okay. Thank you so much. So hello, my name is Evan Faddis and I am <clears throat> the Lincoln unit rep under Sacramento Firefighters Local 522. I'm also a fire captain with the Lincoln Fire Department. We are asking you today to consider using the ARPA funds to help staff the fire department, which is so desperately needed. 
This funding is directly correlated with COVID-19. Here are some highlights why a portion of the ARPA funds should be directed to increase the fire department service to the community. From March 2020 through today, the fire department has been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Responding to COVID-19 relay calls is a near daily occurrence for our engine companies. Being on the front lines of the pandemic and the constant contact with patients that are at the height of their illness has led to illness among staff in the closure of fire stations on a periodic basis due to our inadequate staffing. Just want to give you a quick history of our staffing. Um, in 2011, we reduced our fire engine staffing from three personnel down to two personnel, which is far below the National Fire Protection Association 1710 recommendation staffing levels of four firefighters per engine. This reduction improved our response times because we opened a closed fire station, but it increased the amount of time to assemble enough personnel at the scene to adequately mitigate the emergency. The city has tried to increase funding for public safety over, over the last several years through several avenues. First was Measure K, a utility tax that would increase our general fund, but it was not approved by voters. In 2020, we applied for the SAFER grant, but were unsuccessful. In 2021, we applied for the SAFER grant yet again, and again, we were unsuccessful. In 2021, the city secured a new tax sharing agreement for the public safety, but unfortunately, our three firefighter positions were cut from the budget. Our population continues to grow, and our call volume has nearly increased 100% since 2011. This has resulted in an increase in job-related injuries with one fire captain out with a long-term back injury. In closing, our fire department needs to grow to meet the needs of our community. The average age of our fire department is 45 years old. In the next 10 years, the department will have nearly 100% turnover of our personnel. That's a combined 240 years of experience serving the citizens of Lincoln that will be lost with limited time to pass that knowledge on to the next generation of firefighters. We have a chance to fund our own SAFER grant for the next few years, and it will give us time to research and allocate funds to continue to fund these firefighter positions. Hiring of these new positions would get us closer to the city's recent goal of 0.66 firefighters per 1,000 residents. We currently stand at 0.4 firefighters per 1,000 residents. Thank you for your consideration in the use of these funds. And if you have any questions, I can go ahead and answer them for you. And I do have some um, numbers as far as cost and salary and um, how much that would be if, if somebody else could answer, so. All right. Thank you, Captain Faddis. Really appreciate that and uh, hanging here with us um, in this conversation. All right, so let's go to the council. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Joyner, questions, comments? Uh, no questions, really a comment. Evan, I don't think you need to sell any of us on, on this notion. I think we are all uh, behind it conceptually and if we can pull it off, my suspicion is it's gonna be a unanimous uh, decision. Um, it's. I guess I do have a minor question. How do we let those new hires know that their job is dependent upon those um, one-time revenues, if you will? Um, and it's, it is potential, just as it would be with the SAFER grant, that at the end of a three-year period or, or whatever period we decide upon, those funds will not be available to continue their job. Do you Within the contract, do you let them know that so that they're aware? How do you address that? Um, Council member Joyner, that would be an HR and legal uh, issue that I wouldn't expect uh, Evan to really have a solid answer on. That's something that we'll have to handle internally as executive staff. Yeah, but I would just, I, I would want those individuals hired under the program to know that there is that risk, um, and but that we'll be doing everything we can to mitigate that risk, obviously. Yeah, and I think that's totally fair. They're, they're under the COPS program, which is very similar to Safer. You know, uh, these are uh, this, these kinds of programs where you know you potentially sh should have to keep them on board afterwards. Um, but I, I I think that's an easy conversation. And frankly, you know, we're, we're going to make it this high of a priority. We'll find a way to make it work. And and and, and incidentally, as well, I don't think it does us any good to overstaff. And by that, I mean, be super aggressive in, a, in this safer grant idea. If we know, for like, for example, there's no way we're going to be able to hire 20 firefighters and keep 20 on board in three years, right? So okay. I'll bring you some kind of financial modeling on what I think. Right. I, I think the goal right now is nine. 
So I think that's a, a moderate yeah. thing to shoot for. Go ahead, Dan. Well, what was this? I keep paying Safer Grant, and it's been reported out 30 times over the course of the last couple of years. How many people was it for? What was it for? I know it was to, it's a three year plan where the government, where the rest of the state mm -hmm. uh, fire marshal, I guess, pays their salary for three years, mm -hmm. then they're ours, and that's fine. What did we ask for? It How was many? for it was for 18, 18 staff we for members. We asked for different ones both times. Yeah. So the, they weren't the, always the same. The first time it was less. And then when they did some more work this last year, it was 18 plus equipment and training. Go ahead, Evan, you can speak to this a little bit better. Go ahead. So, yeah, so the first time we applied, we asked for nine positions, so nine firefighters. Um, we were unsuccessful, so we looked into greater detail of why we were turned down. And so, as I referenced the National Fire Protection Association 1710, that recommendation is for four personnel per fire engine. And that's the goal of set, or that's the goal of the SAFER grant is to get every uh, fire engine to that um, goal of four firefighters. So, when we asked for nine positions the first time, that was only gonna get us to three personnel per engine. So the second time to increase our chances, we asked for nine additional, so for a total of 18, hoping that would increase our chances and get us that much closer to reaching that end of PA 1710. But both times we were turned down, so. Um, the, um... Three, not uh, to add, we have three stations. We have an engineering station or a truck, whatever you call them. To man apparatus. That, we, uh, apparatus, right. To uh, man that three people, we have to add a person per shift. And we run three shifts. There's an ABC. Uh, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So that's nine people. That is no um, uh, no backup, no somebody goes on sick leave, you're not at three people per station. And also we need 12 people uh, to meet the uh, the general plan requirement of whatever it was, I can't remember, 6.6 6 people with our current uh, population, we're short 12 people. With the intention be, to be, because the intention of the tax sharing agreement would be to get to the 12 people, no staffing for new residents. Okay. Um, and I guess you could use 12 people even though they aren't correctly dividable by three shifts, three times and three stations. Anyway, um, so, the and the safer grant was for three years um, so we need to know if we're going to do this sharing ag ag agreement that the, the self-funded safer sharing plan the john scully self-funded savings plan or s4 um, <laughs> The um, we need to know what the increase, what the revenue projections are on the tax sharing, because I don't think they're anywhere near. We're spending about two hundred and sixty-three k per per fireman uh, on this in this year's budget. Well, uh, I have some good news for you. Um, that one of the one of I was actually pleasantly surprised to to I asked um, uh, HR to run me some 
um, costing on on what it would be to hire some new firefighters. And we're not talking. We we can ta have the discussion about whether they want to be. We want to recruit for laterals, but let's just assume for the same sake of discussion, these are brand new, mm -hmm. uh, recent recent academy grads. Even um, <clears throat> they are quite a bit less expensive because they're all coming in as pep uh, um, folks and. Um, it, so it's really not as expensive as I thought. In fact, I think that the number that she quoted me was around 140 fully soaking wet with, you know, um, benefits, which was quite lower than I thought. Um, so, so you could make a good dent at that cost for at that cost. You could, yes. Yeah. It's half of what, but, uh, you've also got, uh, capital costs. For each person, because yep. mm -hmm. you don't want them fully wet. All right, thank you, Dan. Alyssa, you have comments, questions? Um, no, I'm literally scrolling through the final guidelines right now, trying to figure out when the funds have to be expended, even if we claim that off the top 10 million uh, revenue loss, because I. I, I, I want this program to work. I want to do it, but I want to make sure we can actually use these funds for it. Um, so that's why my eyes have been looking down. <laughs> if I find it, I'll let you know. Um, but I, I would love to find a way to do it along with that match requirement like we talked about at the council meeting so that we're appropriately backfilling with the tax sharing agreement funds. Good. But I want to make sure we can do it. I don't want to be so enthusiastic about a cool idea that we don't dot our I's and cross our T's and make sure that it's actually something that's feasible. I agree. Yep. All right. Council Member Lauritsen. I also agree. But, uh, you know, hopefully we can use these funds over a number of years and that'll get us through to, the, to a time when maybe we have enhanced, uh, as I said this before, enhanced uh, uh, tax revenue. Uh, I, 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 anyway, I'm all for you know uh, staffing up our, our fire department, and if we can use this money for that purpose, that's good. And hopefully, we can use it for more than uh, two or three years. If uh, what Sean is saying is true, that you know we can you know we can take that 10 million and then use it for a number of years. That's that's, that's my hope. It, um, just real quick, uh, even if. Uh, let's say that I'm totally wrong and this money has to be spent within the same timelines. Um, that, that date, you don't, you only have to have it obligated by December 31st of 2024, but you can continue to spend it until December 31st of 2026. Yeah, okay, that's good. So we're okay. No. Either way. I'm trying to see if my logic is right on this, Sean, but so the 10 million, you know, that you can claim as revenue loss, is still subject to all of the other guidelines. So there's no, you know, backfilling financial reserves. There's no putting it towards pensions, blah, blah, blah. Because I, I just saw it. it says that all, all uses of these funds are held to those standards, right? And then there's certain restrictions based on what kind of um, entity you are. So we have certain ones that are on cities. That covers part of it. However, oh, and they're all subject to the timelines. That said, if we're claiming a 10 million revenue loss, can't we just then encumber that and expend it as a transfer to our general fund? And we've now completed the transfer and we report that back. And now anything that we do with that money, we just do with that money. Correct. So I think, I think we're good. Yeah. I think we do have to probably report it within that timeline as a revenue loss backfill. And that's what we report to the federal government. And then what we do with those funds is what we do with our general fund. That's I, what I'm, that's what I, I think, think that you, you might've missed that when you were in transition, but, but Sean actually explained no, that. I heard him say that, oh, okay. but I just read through all of yeah. it. And I think he's right. Yes. Is what I'm saying. Like everything okay. that's in there, we still, <laughs> at the point that it's general funds, we could do what we want with it. Exactly. But I just wanted, cause he said that he wasn't sure if oh, okay. that's what he thought, but he couldn't find it. So I put a second set of eyes well, on it. And I think that. exactly. Thank you for I that. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. I agree with you, I guess, is what I was trying to say. I just okay. read through it and I, I agree awesome. with what you were saying. I appreciate so he's that. thoroughly enjoyed hearing you say multiple times. Well, that Sean right. was right. Yeah, that's Well, right. it might not happen that often. So he might want to take like a screenshot or a small <laughs> video. I don't know. Good. Well, here's the other thing too. I think that um, there's a really good chance that 
um, if we do this and the fire department applies for the safer grant at a later date again, that they have a better chance of getting it because the the feds will see us actually putting money towards it instead of just sitting back hoping that we get this money if we can show that we're actually investing in it and we're making an effort i think there's a better chance that we we could get it next time which would only help us down the road you know to to um, spread it out even farther now of course that's not a guarantee but i think that's in talking with different people i think that's um one of the thought lines too that 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 might help us down the road. So uh, you're in into the road if we need it next time. We done something wrong because our annexation agreements are set up to support the growth mm -hmm. that they cause. Mm -hmm. If we do this thing, it gets us in the case of fire. To the to where we should have been all along. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, well that's a good point. And and we can't forget the obligation that of the tax sharing fund. It needs to be it's public safety for both. Last year we knew, need, used it primarily for police because of the dispatch need. And this year we're going to probably use it for fire, but but all of the all of the tax sharing um, increment goes to both police and fire. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So just just clarification, that. Dan. Dispatch serves both agencies. Oh well, yeah. And and we also did authorize the hiring of a battalion chief. Um, while the focus was on PD for various reasons, um, there was an effort um, to assist the fire department as well. And you're correct that the intention this time out, as the next budget comes around, is to focus on, on fire personnel. So, But it, let's also remember that one of the obligations of the Village One tax sharing agreement is that a revenue measure be placed on the ballot for the citizens to... Uh, to vote on somewhere down the road, uh, well, and, that far away. Well, and if the again, if the citizens see us making an effort and putting money towards it, they'll be more likely to agree to a tax increase, um, other than us just depending on them. So I think it's a win-win both ways. So um, let's go out to um, public comment. See if anybody else has uh, anything to say. Uh, Ms. Gallen, do we have any hands raised? Uh, no, Mayor. No hands are raised. Okay, well, all right. So let's bring it back to the council. And so um, so what's our next step, Sean? Are we just giving you direction to go ahead and run the numbers and kind of put together a package for us to talk about it again and get this rolling for us for to approve or not approve? No, I don't I don't need any further. I mean, I, I, I already knew that this was probably what the direction okay. wanted to go. This is more than enough. I'll, I'll basically give you a menu of at this many new firefighters, it's gonna cost this much over a three year period at you know, and then I'll, um, we'll do a little bit of work to try to figure out if we can do some more advanced projections of the, of the new tax sh uh, sharing arrangement and what we think that's going to, to bring in. But, you know, probably the way it works is how, what Dan just mentioned, where, you know, as you, as that agreement matures, you're spending less of your ARPA dollars to fund those positions. And hopefully then the little bird flies on its own one day and we don't yeah. need it. But, what, it, what in reality S4 does, I like that, um, is it allows us to preload and to get the, how many ever people on board immediately rather than one or two a year for in number of years, which is really great. So we can have another group retire all at the same time, you know, 30 years from now. <laughs> okay. So, so quick question. Any any thought about whether to price firefighter paramedics within this as well? Whether we want to explore those options? Oh, 100%. Well, no. the other thing that you can do, if you remember every time 
we've talked about fire uh, paramedics. There's been two uh, two stumbling blocks. Uh, one is the the getting people certified or hiring certified people. The other one is the cost of the equipment. We certainly could do uh, buy some ambulance or, or health EMS trucks with this money. I'm not saying we have a, enough money to do it. Mm -hmm. We could buy the trucks. Hopefully, my idea is, well, well I think getting and, the you could, and you could fund perfectly legally, you could fund the certificate, the paying for the certification of people to get paramedics into your yep. own crew yep. and so sure. on. That's so I'm just talking about, as Sean runs the numbers, yep. do we want that as a breakout? Right. But, I yeah. think so. And also, um, not to keep piling on, but I also want to see the numbers for the type three truck that they had requested um, that was in the budget that got pulled last year um, to see if that's something that's even feasible. But I think looking at the numbers for the paramedic um, and that equipment is a, is a really great idea, Paul. I think that's something that it would be helpful to know if it's if we can do it or not. The latest numbers um, that I received from uh, Chief Alves just the other day on the Type 3 engine, it looks like the, and this will be a budget request, we could talk about it within ARPA too if you want, but is four four seventy seven. $477,000. Okay. Last paramedic, the last EMS truck that I saw are about a quarter of a million. So that's two EMS trucks. So well, are you talking about creating rescue units effectively, Dan? Two-man rescue units? Yeah. Well, doing all the medical calls, and small I, equipment. Mm -hmm. I understand. I, I, I've often thought that that is a solution, yeah. given the fact that a majority of our calls are medical, medical. in nature. Um, but then the, the, the halfway step is a firefighter paramedic on each apparatus. Um, well. And, and Evan's probably pulling his hair out here, trying to to figure out where we're headed with this. I just I just want to know the numbers and what our options are. Yep, I would agree with that. All right. Okay, any other comments about funding FIRE, the ARPA money? Are we all good? And Sean's got his direction. Okay, all right. So um, item number five, any council initiated business? Does anybody have anything they want to share? So are we saying that that entire 10 million is going to go to FIRE? No. no. But, no because no, we're no, going no. to have the infrastructure yeah, yeah, no, 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 well. no. Yeah. So, oh, are we going to have that conversation right now, or are we going to hold that off for? <laughs> I think I think you discuss holding holding on that one for now. Yeah. We're going to need to come back to you a few more times to really fully form this and yeah. refine and refine and refine. Yeah. Um. So, and I know these are hard conversations because it's just such an unusual situation, <laughs> you know. But uh, did did I miss it? How much are we talking for this safer grant program total? I, I haven't as, a, attributed a number to it, but to give you a rough a rough idea for a three year term, um, you you could it was it's going to be in the two to two point two million range um, if you're thinking about nine positions. Um, so I'm going to basically come to you with okay, here's what three looks like, here's what six looks like, here's what nine looks like, here's what twelve looks like, and here's what your paramedic training and recruitment looks like and then you could choose what you think is and we could start small and build our way up so i think uh it'll help so approximately 20 percent of all of our funds so it would be about 20 percent business and nonprofit, 20 percent public safety and then the remaining 60 percent infrastructure i i feel like that tracks Dan, what do you, does that, well, I mean, it's still 80% yeah, general I, fund essential it. services, but it's a, it would be about 20% of our overall funds towards public safety, but we talk all the time about prioritizing public safety. So I feel like that's. Yeah. With me. No, at, at, the, at that level, it's fine. I'm just, 
going through the complexities of what are the, there's a lot of variables to make it work properly. Correct. It, and it would need yeah. to, but it's a lot of money to throw at something if it's just going to throw it at it to make us right. feel good or to make somebody else feel good or to, for optics. I don't want to, I don't want to play that game, but I would like to do something meaningful though. Right. So. Okay. All right. Um, thank you all for that. Um, great conversation. Any council initiated business? Paul? You know, I thought I had something that I could slip under council initiated business, but it appears I didn't write a note when it popped into my mind. So, no. Okay. Dan? No. <laughs> Alyssa? Bill? No. No? Okay. No. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it is 544 and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Evan. Thank, thank thanks, you. Tom. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for the direction.